Hi, welcome to the Andrew Buckle book review of the Captain Marvel Omnibus. This has just come out, 888 pages from Marvel. This includes Marvel Super Heroes 12 and 13, as well as Captain Marvel 1 to 33, as well as some Not Brand Eck, and also Iron Man 55, first appearance of Thanos. So 888 pages of classic Captain Marvel action. You can see the standard design there for the omnibus. So you've got Captain Marvel Omnibus in the usual standard black, as well as volume one. So I assume at some point there'll be a volume two. You can see there Captain Marvel, as actually spelled Captain Marvel there, which is very unusual since it's called Captain Marvel there. And on the back cover, you've got that. And you can see there, here's the original Captain Marvel in green. Here's Captain Marvel as we later knew him. You got a really long list of letterers, writers, artists. I mean, I think that was one of the problems for this book. It changed all over the place. Unfortunately, the contents also has a problem. It doesn't hate the writers or letterers or anything like that. It'd be really nice if it included that in the contents. You always have to go back and check the previous list. Now, it does have a brilliant introduction from Roy Thomas. Always good, but unfortunately, this one is from 2005. Captain's Marvels. First issue, Marvel Superheroes, issue 12. And that also included Black Knight, the Destroyer, Captain America. Unfortunately, they're not in this book. But still, the coming of Captain Marvel. And so it begins. And you can see by Gene Colan. Captain Marvel comes to Earth with Yonrog as well as Una. Now, he has to have a breathing potion so he can breathe for 60 minutes without his mask on. Also, another problem, as soon as he gets to Earth, because this is the Kree coming to Earth to do various discover various things about humanity. You'd think they could have... Still, he's discovered straight away. But conveniently, or amazing coincidence, there's someone that gets killed and he replaces him, ends up in a military base. Well, technology, I suppose they can, of course, tweak things, change things, but still. We're on to the sentry. Not the sinister, sinister sentry, or sentry sinister as it was called in Fantastic Four. Where stalks the sentry? Now, I must admit that is a pretty rough bit of artwork there from Gene Colan. Now, of course, Gene Colan's a brilliant artist, but I don't know why the, that restoration is slightly odd. But still, you've got that story. Also, another complication, straight away, <laughs> the guy that runs the motel is slightly a bit wary of him, which is not surprising since it's a military base and he does come across as slightly odd and suspicious. He's also carrying this device. But still, you have got the sentry, at least a decent villain, right at the start of the book. And then you got the first issue. Now that was originally in Marvel Super Heroes number 12 and 13, but now we're into Captain Marvel, he gets his own title. And the thing about Captain Marvel is obviously, you got there, Marvel Spaceborn. Again, they put all these various things to make certain everyone knows it's Marvel. And you've still got the Sentry. Now, unfortunately, after this story, this great start, you think they would have gone with lots of information about the Kree. Maybe other Kree characters could have turned up. They could have introduced the Scrolls because there was that sort of Scroll Kree. That would have made more sense. But instead, the story just went downhill with lots of very duff sort of characters that I just really don't know. And probably most people cannot, can't even remember nowadays. But at least you've got the Super Scroll here. Now, I love the Super Scroll, great character. And that's a reasonable cover, not too bad. And that's another problem with a lot of the Captain Marvel. I think probably the reason why they were not so successful when it first came out, or maybe there were other reasons I don't know, but you, you've got the letters pages there. But look at that dramatic green cover. Now that would have sold, sold it to me. I love that sort of thing on, on the newsstand. If I see anything like that, I think, wow, that really stands out. But after that, some of the covers were truly awful. You have got, I'm saying that, the next one's not too bad. You've got Submariner. But after that, it does go downhill. You've got like these really odd characters. Even got Quasimodo, Quasimodo character. And this one, Solem. Again, other characters that I've just never heard of or robots that just come along, random robots. And this lot, the Archon between Hammer and Anvil. Again, you could have introduced the scrolls, you could have had the Kree coming, a whole load of different stories that would have made it at least interesting, learn a lot more about this Kree empire. But instead, no. The moment of the manslayer. Though we have got Zoe, as some person points out. Oz, of course, backwards. But here, again, you've got this cover. It's sort of 
Really? I don't know how that got through. It just seemed, especially since Martin Goodman was quite often turning around saying, I don't like that cover. I'm not certain why these sort of covers, I mean, this one, even with Iron Man, I mean, dramatic, obviously have an Iron Man story, but while a galaxy beckons, just not very good. And, but they did get some quite unusual, dramatic ones. And this is number 15. I really thought it was quite impressive. That Zoe might live, a galaxy must die. I mean, that, you know, quite dramatic there. Pencils by Tom Sutton. Now, it's obviously very, just a crackling of energy coming through, but it still was quite very interesting. And also, they really started to stretch things and try to sort of make it really more cosmic, which was something that I didn't really feel, even with all the aliens coming, the stories didn't really feel very cosmic particularly. And however, that, of course, changed completely dramatically with issue 17, when the artwork, now you've course got supreme intelligence. You've always got to have the supreme intelligence turn up once in a while. But issue 17, Gil Kane, my favourite artist. And the artwork is superb, really brilliant, unchained. And I think there was something saying about this issue really made everyone sort of stand up and notice. I mean, dramatic. So unchained. And you've got, of course, change. A real major change. Obviously, the previous issue was green. Now he's got this red and blue. And it really stands out. And a child shall lead. And the reason about this is, of course, the Shazam. Shazam and Captain Marvel. Of course, child, Billy Batson. And now you've got Captain Marvel. Very dramatic there. No, of course, saying the word Shazam. That would have been too pretty. But the artwork is first rate. And actually, the artwork, the rest restoration, is infinitely superior to the early pages. The early pages really don't look great, to my mind. I don't know why. They're just not as good as these ones. These really, really stand out. So that's great. Though, all things, of course, <laughs> they never last. And then, of course, what happens? You've got that one there. Got issue 20. But then it went downhill a bit. Went downhill. And you've got this, I don't even know really what this character was, Megaton. I mean, really, Megaton? No, that just didn't do it. I remember at the time when I saw it on the newsstand, I thought, Megaton, the nuclear man. Nope, that was a non-starter for me. And there was quite a few duff ones after that. We've also got issue 55 of Iron Man. Really nice to include this, because, of course, this is the dramatic first appearance of Thanos and Drax the Destroyer. Well, obviously, in the cover, it's more the Blood Brothers. But still, it is a very important issue and really nice they've included it. I'm actually surprised they didn't include some other ones because there were a few other issues that Captain Marvel appeared that they could have perhaps included. But still, the Avengers ones that come to mind. But they're not included. So you've got that. But you have got the next issue, which is the one that I really, really loved. When it came on the newsstand, I thought, wow, this was it. I just started buying it on a regular basis. Captain Marvel, this was a winner as far as I was concerned. Captain Marvel, Jim Starlin, just brilliant. A Taste of Madness. You know what, I didn't even realise that was the title. I just remembered just that dramatic cover with obviously the Hulk. Now the Hulk does actually appear early. There's a couple of stories with the Hulk that were actually quite decent as well. But Jim Starlin artwork, it was just great. This one as well, Captain Marvel, number 26. I just love Betrayal. I always remember that bit where he bashes through the door and you've got the woman standing there. So dramatic. And you've got, of course, Thanos there. Enter the ever-loving blue, I think, and of course... At this point, we don't know that that's Thanos. I expect some people probably did. Oh, that's Thanos. But I didn't know it was Thanos at this point. But you've got some great other things here. You've got here Captain Marvel, game Thanos. You've got the Avengers, of course. The stories were just so brilliant. And the artwork was brilliant. I loved all the Greek sort of ideas here. Also, you've got uh, this, the controller. Now, the controller turned up in the Iron Man comics, early ones, issue about 10 or 11 or something. But here, absolutely spoke the controller. Not particularly a, the world's greatest of villains. Thanos, of course, becomes all-powerful. And that's a dramatic story all the way through. I'm not going to obviously tell the story. Everyone probably has read it in other editions. But these stories, of course, have been reprinted many times, the Thanos ones. So. It's got a nice selection of bonus material. I always think omnibuses should have lots of bonus pages. 50 or 60 bonus pages, I think. But still... That's great, but this is even better. You've got those pencil pages. I love these. This is from Marvel Superheroes number 13 by Gene Colan. Now, they have been done before. They've been reprinted. I've seen them quite a few years ago. But still, just great to see them in this omnibus collection. So you've got that. Also, you've got some lovely layout sketches as well. Gil Kane work. I mean, just always glorious to see. I wish they'd included even more. There must be more material than this. 
but still. Also, you've got these lovely inked pages. They're always good. And it's always nice, of course, to see the ink pages because you see how crisp the artwork is, really. And you're seeing it exactly as the original, as well as these. I love these ones. I bought those and they came out. And I love that one as well. The Life of Captain Marvel. That's always just great to see that. Is this the greatest omnibus of all time? No, I don't think so. It has to be said that it's just, it's okay. It's got some great stories. Obviously the Jim Starlin stories, the Gil Kane stories, I think are brilliant. I really like the earlier stories, but I, some of the stories are pretty rubbishy and I don't think I'll ever reread them again, I must admit. But still, you've got there the Captain Marvel stories all the way through to issue 33. And also, of course, some additional ones like Iron Man 55, the classic, which has been reprinted obviously many times as well. But there it is, that's the edition I've got anyway. I don't know what the other cover is of this, but Captain Marvel, Omnibus Edition, though weirdly it's called Captain Marvel. I don't know why they did that. It's weird. You'd think it would just be called Captain Marvel. That's what it says on the front. No, it's Captain Marvel there. Still, totally recommended, especially if you love Captain Marvel.